Doctor. Yes, please. Great. Uh, I want to start by um, welcoming our uh, candidate for finance director, Kelly Flannery, has uh, just walked into the room. We're excited that you're here. I uh, invite everyone to take the opportunity to chat with her, and um, we'll, be, we'll be making a big decision there, so get, get all the information that you need on that one. And also want to welcome a couple of new committee members, Russ Pulley and Nancy Van Rees. We are excited that you've joined us. And Sharon Hurt, I knew it wasn't Tom Druffle, thank you. And Sharon Hurt, who's been, <laughs> she's always been sitting here. And Sharon Hurt, thank you for making note of that. And Council Member Hurt, awesome. All right, with that, let's, uh, let's jump right into the business at hand. We'll begin with RS 2020, no, we'll begin with the consent agenda. I'll read through these items, let me know if we need to pull any of these off. Items on consent are resolutions, RS 2021 1167, 1168, 1170, 1179, and 1180. And on second reading, Bill BL 2021 915. Those are the items proposed for consent. Does anyone want to pull any of those off? I'm looking for hands. Councilmember Hurt. Uh, does that require taking it off consent or can we just note that? We will note that. Uh, we don't need to take it off consent, but we will note that you're, you're abstaining. 1179. Hurt abstains. Anything else? Need to come off consent. Councilmember Glover. Hang on. Let me find you. Yes, sir. So help me understand. So if she's going to abstain and it's on consent, then what happens tomorrow night? Is it, if, if it makes it through all the other committees, is it still on consent tomorrow night? It or will does... not be on consent okay. tomorrow night. Okay, that was my question. All right, thank you. And you keep track of that. Correct. Okay, yes. good question. Thank, thank you. you. All right, anything else need to come off consent? Seeing no, I will read through the items on consent. They are... Um, RS 2021 1167 sponsors Allen and Toombs accepts a grant from the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services to the state trial courts to provide Tennessee Highway Safety Officer Recovery Court enhancements to existing recovery court programs and services to approve alcohol countermeasures. That's on consent to approve. Next is RS 2021 1168 Council uh, sponsors Allen and Toombs. This approves a contract between the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services and the Metro government for establishing agreed rates for court ordered evaluations and treatment for defendants charged with misdemeanor crimes. That is on consent to approve. Resolution RS 2021-1170 sponsors O'Connell, Allen, Bradford, and Stahl. This accepts the terms of a cooperative purchasing master agreement for portable automatic seating risers for the Nashville Municipal Auditorium. I have a letter to approve from the sponsor. That's on consent to approve. Next is 11, uh, RS 2021-1179. Council Member Hurt is abstaining on this one. The sponsors are Allen, Evans, Bradford, Toombs, and Welsh. This approves an amendment to a grant from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to the Metro Board of Health to provide for the prevention, surveillance, diagnosis, and treatment of HIV AIDS and administer a minority AIDS initiative program. Next is RS 2021-1180, sponsors Allen and Evans. This approves a grant from the Tennessee Department of Safety and Homeland Security to the Metro Nashville Police Department to continue the enhanced DUI enforcement initiative and target distracted driving and seatbelt enforcement. And a bill's on second reading. On consent is BL 2021-915, sponsors Toombs, Van Rees, Suara, and Porterfield. This approves an agreement between the Metro Department of Parks and Recreation and Memphis Basketball LLC to allow parks to participate in a youth basketball program operated by Memphis Basketball LLC. And I have just realized that I did not take roll. So um, uh, in order to know how many people are voting for consent, 
Ms. Lightland, can roll, roll, do you, do you we'll do roll, roll real quick so we'll know how many we've got and uh, and we'll go from there. So do you want to do the roll for us? Sure. Councilmember Allen? Here. Druffle? Here. Glover? Here. Hurt? Here. Mendez? Here. Pul Pulley? Aye. Roten? Aye. Sledge? Aye. Suara? Here. Syracuse? Here. Toombs? Here. Van Rees? Here. Vircher? Present. 13 present. All right, 15 present. 13. Yeah, we're glad. And we have perfect attendance, which is impressive. So now, all those in favor of the consent agenda in indicate by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Like sign, consent agenda passes 15 to nothing. And we will move on to items that are not on consent, which gets us to RS 2021-1166. Sponsors O'Connell, Parker, Allen, Bradford, Toombs, Welsh, and Suara. This accepts a donation from the Congress group in the amount of $2.5 million as a contribution to the Barnes Housing Trust Fund and approves a donation from the Congress group in the amount of 500,000 to a 2B formed nonprofit entity for the benefit of Wharf Park. And I have a letter from Council Member O'Connell to approve. Do I have a motion? Do I have a motion for approval? Thank you. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion or questions? Indicate by raising your hand, our buttons aren't working. I don't see anyone with questions, so we'll Go ahead and vote. All those in favor? And any opposed? All right. That, I believe that was 15 in favor, none against. 13. 13. Who did we lose? We just have 13. Members. Gotcha. 13 in favor, zero against. All right. Next is, that's on consent. Consent. RS 2021-1169, sponsors Allen, Bradford, and Stiles. This authorizes Fairgrounds Nashville and Municipal Auditorium to accept community development block grants funds from the Metro Development and Housing Agency. Been moved and somebody else has seconded. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions, comments? Council Member Glover. Thank you, Chair. So help me understand exactly what this is with the fairgrounds and, and what this does. Great question. Uh, do we have someone from either the fairgrounds or MDHA or uh, Mary? We'll start with Ms. Wiggins. And in reality, municipal auditorium as well. I'm, this is kind of confusing as to why we're doing this. Gotcha. Good question. All right. Uh, Ms. Wiggins, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair. So the origination of trying to get these funds to municipal and uh, the fairgrounds all stems from them sheltering during the COVID um, sheltering with our homeless population. So. Uh, there were funds available through CDBG for different sheltering activities and in an effort to see what could be reimbursed to those two entities who couldn't produce any revenue during that time that they were um, running the shelter operations is, is there any kind of reimbursement to them? We looked and looked and the only reimbursement available was depreciation and the cost of insurance allocated to the spaces that were used for the sheltering operations. So the totals for each of those entities are equal to um, depreciation and the amount of insurance they paid for the exact you know, space used for the operations for the sheltering time. And so those funds are being awarded to them. Oops, sorry. So that naturally leads me to the question I'm gonna ask next. We could debate on, their, they, they couldn't make any revenue. I think you, we could sit here and debate that. I would have a different answer than you would. However, that being said, as we go into the winter season again, are the plans to not, no longer use the uh, fairground facility because we're gonna use it for housing? Or are we gonna let that start moving forward to where it does generate revenues and we're not missing opportunities for that, uh, ex that, that pretty large investment we made out there uh, and also for the people of Nashville to be able to utilize it the way it was designed and the money was spent for. What's the thought process there? So I, I can't speak to specific plans for operations out at the fairgrounds other than it's not being used as a shelter. Okay. So it doesn't qualify for additional funding through the CDBG funds. Okay, thank you, Chair. And did I see Laura Womack from the fairgrounds back there? Do you have anything you wanna add to that? Let me turn your mic on public table. I think that's it. Hello. Yes, there you go. Thank you so much. No, um, 
Ms. Wiggins has been working with us um, for a very long time. Like she said, we, we pursued every funding option. We thought we, we targeted some small venue funds and, and we just couldn't qualify for them. So we we're very grateful for her assistance in, in identifying this particular fund. And um, it's a significant amount of money for us, as you know, so we'd appreciate your support. Thank you. And can you speak to the, the second question about um, income generating activities this winter? Do you foresee a, a, a more normal uh, activity this, this winter? I do, I do. We are always, of course, in I think in an emergency situation, but um, we are full steam ahead. We had a full weekend of activities this past weekend and our calendar is, is really jam packed now. Um, for the foreseeable future, and we've got a lot of events planned for 2022 already. That's great news. Thank you. Any any other questions? Uh, Councilmember Hurt. Whoop. Got it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I know historically the Community Development Block Grant used to be um, uh, for uh, low-income communities, and uh, well, I know that they had some funds that were set aside, so to speak, for those communities. Um, and, and these major uh, agencies like the Fairgrounds and Municipal Auditorium did not necessarily qualify. So I'm just wondering if they've changed the criteria from whom those funds should be given and uh, can we get a list of all of those and the amounts that they are distributing those funds? Good, good question. I, I see Mr. Alexander from MDHA. Sure, Emil Alexander, Director of Community Development at MDHA. To answer the last part of the question, yes, I can send you a, a copy of the, all the agencies that were funded under the CDBG CARES funding. And I want to just highlight that these were CARES Act funding. They had to be used specifically to respond to COVID-19 in our community. So they reimbursed um, municipal and the fairgrounds for expenses for sheltering homeless populations. So that's why it qualified for eligible expense under the CARES Act as opposed to regular CDBG. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Emil. I really appreciate that. But I know there are a lot of businesses that, that uh, sheltered the homeless population too, whether they wanted to or not. Yep. They were there, you know, and they had to clean up behind them and do uh, many things. And I also know many of them are fed because I know when um, I was there, we, we feed them all the time. They, they lay out, we let them take showers and all of those kinds of things. But I know it's not necessarily uh, something that we were doing in order to get paid to do. We were just doing what a servant's heart would do. But when funds are designated for those kinds of things, I do think that we should ensure that those agencies uh, receive uh, funding to help them through this, and and especially those small nonprofit organizations that don't realize and know that they should uh, receive some community block grant funds. No, absolutely. We actually distributed over, let's say, $15 million in funding to nonprofit homeless service providers and nonprofit organizations who were responding to COVID-19 in our community. And again, I can get you a list of those agencies. This was a small portion, and it was an eligible expense for under the CARES Act for CDBG and advised by our HUD TA. Right, but I'm speaking of those nonprofits whose particular targeted audience or their mission is not necessarily to fund the homeless, they have another mission, but in all of the services that they provide, they do serve that homeless population. Absolutely. I'm happy to get you a list of those agencies. I also want to point out... Is there any way that it can be amended and those funds can, uh, we can look at distributing additional funds? There, there's an application process, I believe. Ms. Wiggins, can you speak just to what the process is and how, how different nonprofits... Um, but community Identify. development block grant funds? Uh, okay, back to Mr. Alexander. So it's, it's, it's a little, 50% of our CDBG funds are used for our homeowner rehab program. The rest are, are, are granted out to nonprofit organizations through different RFA processes. I did want to highlight that 99.9% .9 of all of our CDBG funds are used to serve low-income clients and families. So they are accomplishing um, that purpose and that intention. Thank you. If you could provide us that list, that would, that would be helpful. I appreciate your offer. I'll, I'll come back there and talk to you. Sure. Thank you. Councilmember Vercher. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Hurt. You are I'm on, power. Madam Chair. You are so on. 
I just, um, if they could speak to the, to the process, uh, to Councilwoman Hurt's point, how would certain entities know to apply uh, for these grants? That's one. And then two, <clears throat> um, we get like these emails from um, the coordinated care agencies letting us know when they're opening up certain application processes. Um, can we get uh, a process like that implemented for, for these type block grants so that we can disseminate uh, this information to, to our networks also so it's not the same organizations receiving the same funding uh, year, after, year after year? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. So there were, there were two questions there, and I, Mr. Alexander, I think you're still the, the one who can provide. So the first question was how, how can you apply for Specifically, I think the CDD, CDBG block grants is what you're asking about. And then is, can we um, enhance the And also the, the, the CARES component too, because COVID is still here. Gotcha. Absolutely. So there is, it is not a, an additional CARES Act funding that we'll be issuing out through an RFA process. Um, all of our RFA processes are public. We um, usually do a public comment period in the newspaper where the RFA is advertised. We have over 800 people, including every council person, um, in the city is listed on our listserv and they apply to MDHA. Those applications are scored and evaluated and then recommended for funding um, there from that point on. Thank you, I appreciate that. And um, is, there, is there additional information on other CARES funds that you can speak to Ms. Wiggins? Let me um, turn your mic back on. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, not specifically to CARES Act as those funds have been spent, but for the American Rescue Plan funds that are coming up, um, the COVID Oversight Committee is reviewing requests. There is not a current open application process for nonprofits. Um, I don't know that we'll have just a large general you know, application, but what we're really looking at is what are the targeted needs? We've talked a lot recently. There are funds available. There's a, a significant amount of rent, mortgage, and utility assistance. There are other funds that are available, but there's a lack of accessing them. So we're looking at what nonprofits and organizations can help us help those who need it navigate, access, case management. Those are all the different ways we call that. So we may be reaching out to nonprofits to say, hey, if you are somebody who can connect and navigate this process and provide case management, that's some of the next funding that's going to be going out. But so it will look like a more um, directed, organized, very specific channels of need that that will be opening to nonprofits. Thank you. And is there a way to provide that, that information in an email that council members could forward to organizations that we know might be um, interested in that that just may not be already in the loop on that? Is, is there something you could package up that we could throw out to our, through our networks that might expand the, the reach of who you're um, providing the just the, the notifications to? Yeah, sure. I mean, we can come up with something. It's there is not a formal process, so I don't have an application right overview, but we can explain that. That'd be great. Yeah, okay. just an explanation would, would be helpful. Councilmember Vercher, I see another question back there. Can she explain what what does she mean is not a formal process? So as an organization. How would I become a recipient if there's not a formal process? How would I apply? When we actually have an application, there will be a, a formal application process. There just isn't one yet. We're just starting to distribute some of these funds from the rescue plan. So when we have an application process, it will be announced, but there isn't, there is not a, a current open application. So I don't have a form or a time frame to, to share, but that's what I would, I can share that there will be one when it happens. And we can work on notifying people to be ready to see that that application is coming. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. We just want to make sure that those that really need the services are getting the services. What we hear as council members is that many aren't aware that these resources are available to them. And by the time we as a body become informed that we have these resources, they've already been expended to, to, to other entities that, that we weren't made aware of initially. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, good, good point. And any, any way we can help with that notification would be, would be helpful. Council Member Glover, you were the one asking it early, I'm just reminding you. So w what was just said troubles me. So there's not a formal process yet. 
for the latest round of money. Yeah, but where is this money coming from that we're doing for the, what the we're looking auditorium? At now is community development block grants, which is specific. Okay, so it's not so it's not coming from the same pool of money. Okay, all right. I'm, I, I, maybe I was just misunderstood, so I, that's why I wanted to get that clarification. That's okay. These were CDBG funds available through the original CARES Act. Yeah, well, the federal government's just been handing out so much money here lately, it's hard to keep up with what pool it, it flows out of. Thank you. Thank you. Other other questions? I appreciate the, uh, the good questions. If Is that a question, Council Member Sawara? No. Uh, not a question, but I just wanted to provide a... Uh, somewhat of a comment or clarification. I think that what uh, Council Member Hurt is trying to get at is that, oh, and I'm sorry, um, is that yes, we do have organizations that do support people in need, and I think that we are meeting the objectives of getting it to the people in need. But what we're not doing is that there's so many organizations that are minority in nature that are also doing this work. And because of the way we're getting the information out, People that are in the community, that are mom and pop, small organization doing it, sometimes do not get the information. And I think that that's what looking into, to be able to make sure that, yes, we want to get you to the people in need, but we also want to make sure the agencies that we're using are also diverse. It's an important point. Thank you very much. Council Member Hurt. That is absolutely correct. Thank you, Councilmember Suara and Councilmember Virtue. And I do know that the American Rescue Plan money was specifically designated for small nonprofits, small businesses, and those communities of color that have not received those fundings before. Um, actually, today, the SBA, as you all know, the SBA administrator was here and she went up and down Jefferson Street and I was with her. And there were several people who received some PPP, but they received it for like three months. Had no idea that it was going to go on for 18 months. And there they were struggling, trying to figure out how were they going to keep their businesses sustained. And we don't want them to survive, we want them to thrive. And when we have these funds, all of the money that's coming from this administration is to do that. And I think that we have to be very much intentional about ensuring that that money is distributed in those communities. Thank you. Thank you. And it, it may be helpful. Um, I appreciate the information that's being given here. At different points, we've gotten some great, great breakdowns of this pocket of money was available for this use and here's where we spent it and this is available for that. What I'm hearing from Mr. Alexander is CDBG in this particular case was one bucket of money with one set of qualifications. Other, other American Rescue Plan has other qualifications. And we want to do our best as a council to ensure that people know what's available and, and who, to, who to contact to get that. So the more, the more you can help us know what is still out there and who we can reach, that would be, that would be great. Any further questions? Uh, council Member Mendez. Thanks. Um, I think I almost hate myself for continuing this conversation, um, but <laughs> I do want to compliment um, Councilmember Toombs for having the foresight um, last April to sponsor legislation that got three of our colleagues, Councilmember Sepulveda, Councilmember Gal um, Gamble, Councilmember Johnston, on the committee that's making the recommendations to the council. And one of the express purposes, as I understood, of the legislation that got three council members on that committee was to make sure that we had an active voice in making sure that when there was public engagement, the meetings would be public, there'd be lots of notice about what was going on, application process would be public. And uh, I, would, I would encourage colleagues, like we, we do not need a budget and finance committee process. There is a process that got set up already and we can lean on our three colleagues to make sure that um, they voice these opinions at the actual American Rescue Plan committee meetings um, uh, because we, we already set up a process for this. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that reminder. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we are voting on RS 2021-1169. Is that correct? Yes. 1169. Um, All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Approve. 13. Zero against. All right, uh, that one's on. Next is RS. 
Okay, thank you. RS 2021-1171 sponsors Alan Young approves a contract between the Metro government and New Origin Systems Incorporated to provide annual maintenance, support, and necessary upgrades for various mission critical applications for public works. Do I have a Move. second? Been moved and seconded. Any questions, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Uh, Any opposed? We recommend. Next is RS 2021-1172, sponsors Parker, Allen, and Welsh, authorizes the Metro Mayor to submit the da Nashville Davidson Cares Act Substantial Amendment 3 to the 2019-2020 Annual Action Plan to the 2018-2023 Consolidated Plan for Housing and Community Development to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Do I have a motion? Been moved and seconded. Are there any questions? Mr. Alexander, do you, is this one in your bailiwick? Do you want to just very briefly explain what it is? Let me give you power, public table. There you go. This is a, a amendment to the 2019 action plan that this council passed back in July of 2020. It allows us to add a new activity to sort of a new budget line item activity for supportive services for the homeless. And it makes adjustments to other budget items so that you can fund those services. Um, those services will be funded through nonprofit organizations in our community through a separate RFA process. This simply allows Nashville, um, approves Nashville to submit the plan onto HUD for their review and approval. Great, thank you. Any questions? Council Member Glover. Thank you, Chair. I, I know that I, along with several council members uh, throughout the city, are getting phone calls and, and emails constantly on these homeless camps that are popping up in, in the districts, uh, and not in one part of town, it literally is all over town. What's the objective of this, and, 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 and will we really be able to see an impact on eliminating these homeless camps that are literally spread throughout the city? Will this do something that will consolidate that to actually start putting together a solution to obviously a growing problem that we have in Nashville. Um, uh, and I don't know if I asked that question very well, but that, that's the question. What, what will this accomplish uh, and, and how will we start solving the problems that we have? Thank, thank you. you. Good, good question. Mr. Alexander, do you want to speak to what income group this might most affect? Sure. This is targeted for those who are chronically homeless. So it allows um, nonprofit service providers to apply for funding from MDHA to provide that type of outreach to go into those encampments and service the folks that are living there and provide them with case management and supportive services. So, so then, um, so, so then I'm, I'm going to use the example that I'm most familiar with, like Room in the Inn would be available or a Campus for Human Development that would be available for these types of funds. Yes. And I know there's others as well, but yes. that's the one I'm most familiar with. Yes, yes. Okay. Right. Table. Thank and, you. And, and are, they, are they giving us an action plan as to how this will start solving the problems around the city? Yeah, there is a, a, a citywide housing plan um, through the, the COC and uh, Metro Homeless Impact Division sort of heads that up. And there is weekly reporting on data on how this funding is being used and what the outcomes are. And that is a dashboard that's sent out every week that sort of tracks who's being served, where they're going, and the impact that's being make, made with this funding. Thank you. And I would suggest that the uh, Affordable Housing Committee probably will have another info session where Judith Tackett can address that specific uh, plan in general, which is, I think... Uh, I will try and, I'll, I'll try and watch try that. Or, I think that's, that's important right. information. A lot of people it. Thank you. Did I see another hand go up? Council Member Hurt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Also, could these, the, those that may be receiving HOTWA funding, would they also be eligible for these funds? The funding is not directly tied to specifically for HOPWA clients, but you can use the funding to serve right. those. Right. I, I mean, I realize that I know HOTWA yeah. funding is for HOTWA, but because there are some people that may be eligible for HOTWA, also are eligible for or, or in need yep. of the funds that are available. So I'm just wondering if they could use, if they, they would be accessible to both. They can. Okay. They can. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Double dip. Good news. Any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? You recommend 12 in favor, zero against. Approve. Okay. 
Next is RS 2021 1173 sponsors Parker Allen and Welsh. This authorizes Metro Development and Housing Agency to enter into a pilot agreement and accept payments in lieu of ad valorem taxes with respect to multifamily housing project located at 900 Dickerson Pike. Been moved and seconded. Uh, any discussions? This is uh, the low income housing tax credit program that we have used with MDHA multiple times. Um, and Councilmember Parker spoke about it in his, but I will recognize Councilmember Mendez. Thanks. Um, this is the question that I said during affordable housing I wanted to save to budget and finance. Um, I've been a, a supporter of this program. I think it's a good program. I think of all the affordable housing we do, um, I'm guessing this is the lowest cost per unit um, and it's a good program. However, um, we've reached a point now that we're five, six years into this program where other than Mr. Wilshire back there and uh, maybe a couple people from finance, nobody, nobody knows exactly what we spend per year on this program um, and it, it grows every year. And, um, and it's been in place for about five years. The amount will double in another five years. And we've reached the point where we need some cumulative tally um, in addition. And this goes, you know, we, we spent so much energy as a group reforming tax government financing last year to make it predictable, how much more predictable, how much property tax revenue was coming out of the pipeline before we got to the general fund and the regular appropriation process. As this program increases in cumulative amount and we've got other legislation pending that has the effect of pulling property tax revenue out prior to the appropriations process, I feel like I would like to ask finance to help us figure out how we're going to um, keep track of certain numbers better. Um, one is, what is the total amount that, of property tax revenue that we pull out of the system before the appropriations process? So that's TIF, as well as this program, as well as the thing we've got pending um, as legislation. And then secondly, for whatever part of that is for affordable housing, because it's not all for affordable housing, we need to start figuring out some things about cost per unit. Because um, my hypothesis would be when we get to that piece of legislation, later that the cost per unit for this program is dramatically better than anything we could ever dream of for the giving away um, height bonuses for affordable units downtown. And if we've got a finite amount of money to allocate for affordable housing and to pull out of the pipeline before a regular appropriations process, we need to start knowing more about the cumulative amount and the cost per unit for different programs. And so I don't I mean, I, I would like to avoid drafting a piece of legislation to make all that happen. And so I would like to ask finance if they can work on suggestions about how we can get that information, certainly by the time um, we deal with the um, downtown inclusionary zoning legislation. But this is an opportune moment to talk about it because on this piece of legislation, we've been doing this for five, six years now. Only a couple people in this room could say what the total amount is per year. And, um, and we need to know that more publicly. Thank I think you. That's, a, that's an important point that you raised. And, and Mr. Edelman, would you be the person to ask? Um, someone from finance answered the question of what reports show this information and how, how hard is it to find now and is there a way to make it more explicit? Who, who should I direct that to? Okay. Ms. Wiggins. Yeah, uh, Chair, I'm not... I'm not sure what reports we do have. I know even going into this budget cycle, we talked about an overall pilot study so that we could start to quantify. And I think more importantly to the second point about the effectiveness, so the cost per unit. So I will work with the budget and finance team and, and we'll see what reports we have. That'd be, that would be great. And, and what, we, what we can add to it. I think that's, that's an important point. I appreciate you raising that. Any other questions specifically on this pilot? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? We still at 12. Okay, you recommend. Next is RS 2021 1174, sponsors Sledge, Parker, Allen, and Welsh. This authorizes MDHA to enter into a pilot agreement and accept payments in lieu of ad valorem taxes with respect to a multifamily housing project located at 300 Rains Avenue, known as Fairgrounds Site C. 
been moved and seconded. Any questions, comments? Council Member Glover. So I'm, I'm just going to make a comment. It's not a question. Okay. So when we went through the entire process, first of all, I thought we gave the land away. Um, it was uh, whatever we, quote, got for it. But one of the things that was promised in that, if I remember correctly, and I'm pretty certain I do, is that it was going to start generating tax money. So I, I, my, my analysis of this is we're giving away land, and on top of that, now we're giving away tax dollars. So to me, this is a bad deal. Uh, I'm going to vote no on it. But I felt like that that comment needed to be made because I, I just think there was too much in this that was kind of piecemealed, and we continue down that path with a piece of very, uh, very valuable piece of real estate in Nashville that I, I'm not certain we're utilizing it in the way that we could be, should be, et cetera. And if, if this works, um, well, then good. Uh, I'm, I don't know that it will, but at the end of the day, we have other properties around the city that developers would love to be able to utilize for affordable housing. And I think there's a lot better use of how we use those assets versus giving away money. And this, this one gives me heartburn because we basically are giving away money and land. So that's just my, that's my two cents worth and that's my thoughts on it. I see Thank hands you. going up. Thank you. And I, I would like also to recognize Mr. Mr. Melton in a minute. Uh, Mr. Sledge, I think I saw your hands first and then, and then Mr. Mendez. Thank you, Chair. Question for finance. So before this was rezoned, how much property tax revenue was this site generating? Don't have that information handy, Councilman Sledge. We can certainly have that for you before uh, tomorrow's council well, meeting. The answer is zero. It was generating no property tax. After this pilot is passed, will this property, once developed, be generating property taxes? Yes. Thank you. Could I, could I indulge, uh, if the council would, would indulge uh, a little further uh, information with respect to that? I completely acknowledge Councilman Glover's um, questioning of the value um, of this, but I just want to remind uh, the council members that this is really wholly a, in separate apart with respect to the affordable housing units that the developer agreed through a community benefits agreement to implement on this site. Uh, originally 160, 20% 20 of the units, they're already exceeding the 20% obligated. What they pursued through TDHDA was the LIHTC financing. They got that financing, then sky, uh, skyrocketing construction costs put them in a position where they couldn't afford to build the same 160, so they asked to allocate it to 120 units, but have pledged to get to 160 with the other units that they're developing, the other sites. So they're going to get to 160. They're just not going to apply the LIHTC program to it. So we're still getting the bang for the buck that was negotiated in the CBT. Thank you. Councilmember Mendez. Thanks. Um, well, uh, I'll acknowledge that when I first read it, I actually had the exact same first reaction that Councilman Glover did. Um, but I do want to ask Mr. Wilshire something about it, because um, there's, there's something that I always forget the details on. But there, one, of the, one of the reasons why I um, didn't, wasn't going to raise the question that Councilman Glover did is I, I recall there's something to do with the way property taxes work in Tennessee and light type properties that makes it um, fair to, to do this if, if there's a light tech involved. And, but I don't remember the details about how that works. Yes, sir. Mr. Uh, Wilcher. Matt Wilshire from mm -hmm. MDHA. So um, Tennessee, we think, is unique in the country in that it actually uh, charges property taxes on the value of tax credits that are awarded uh, to developers who help make projects affordable. Um, and so that the assessors are directed under a case called the Spring Hill case uh, to value the tax credits when they're valuing a property. And so in certain cases where a property is valued based upon the income that it's generated, you would actually be taxing an affordable housing property more than you would be a comparable market rate property. And this pilot in part offsets uh, that incremental double taxation that's charged. And uh, this was thank a, you, Mr. Wilshire. Thank you. That was uh, a bill that we passed to, to overcome that. Right. And I guess my, my point is I definitely had that uh, same first reaction, um, but, I, but I know that uh, um, a big part of the policy reason why we do these 
pilots through MDHA is to offset um, what where Tennessee is unique in charging uh, or assessing value for the value of the tax credits. Thanks. Thank you. That's an important point. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? No. We recommend 11 to 1. Thank you. I am told 10 to 1. We recommend 10 to 1. Thank you. Next is RS 2021 1176, Allen Welsh Styles Tombs and Suara. This approves an amendment to an, the American Rescue Plan Act grant funds from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to the Metro Action Commission to support activities pertaining to prevention, preparation, and or response to the coronavirus disease. Do I have a motion? Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any Aye. opposed? How many we have now? 11. 10. All right, we recommend 10 to, 10 to 0. Next is RS 2021 1177, sponsored by Allen Bradford Styles and Tombs. This approves a promotion of the arts grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to the Metro National Arts Commission to su support a permanent public art lighting installation and an artist residency program in North Nashville. Do I have a motion? It's been moved and seconded. And we have um, Ms. Vincent from the art department. If I could ask one question, um, I'll just get you coming up. Does anyone else have questions or comments? Thank you. If you could just give us a little bit of details about what this is. Sure, so this is an Our Town grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, which focuses on placemaking projects. Specifically, this is a community initiated project brought to us and in collaboration with Simone Boyd, who's an artist who's a resident of North Nashville and Project Return. So we'll be doing some artist residencies with Project Return who serve citizens returning from incarceration. We'll be doing some temporary artworks and then community engagement work, which will result in a permanent public artwork. And that's the matching funds will come from the public art fund. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Van Rees, let me find you. Yes, ma'am. Oops. Yes, team. There you go. Um, uh, just from personal experience, these things uh, sometimes take a long timeline. <laughs> so I'm wondering, it, it sounds like it's kind of a phasing situation. Can you kind of explain a little bit of the timeline on that? Sure. So these are typically two-year grants with the NEA, and so the, we'll start with the engagement work over the first year or so, and in parallel to that, we'll start planning for the permanent public artwork, which is actually not, this would not be on Metro property. This is a TDOT bridge, and the community is hoping for some lighting underneath the bridge, because right now there is none. Um, of course, that may take some time. We know the um, process there could take a while to get permissions and you know get all of that worked out with TDOT. So it could be you know several years before we see the permanent piece. Thank you very much. Any other questions, comments? Thank you for Thank making you. it possible. All those in favor? Any opposed? You recommend 11 to 1? 11 to nothing. All right. All right. Next is RS 2021 1178, sponsors Allen Evans Styles, Tombs, Welsh, and Suara. This approves the community health workers for a public health response and resilient grant from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to the Metro Board of Health to address COVID 19 health disparities in the Nashville area. Do I have a motion? Been moved and seconded. Uh, Mr. Sharp, can you just give us a brief uh, explanation of how this will be used? Thank you, Madam Chairman. So uh, this is the second grant similar to this. There was a much larger one that came through earlier in the year. Um, this is for outreach and education testing in 15 specific zip codes, um, largely uh, underserved and communities that have been hard hit by the um, by the virus. Um, they will the money will flow through us to um, community health workers. Um, uh, health centers, um, I'm, I'm forgetting another one, F, I think probably FQHCs or similarly situated health clinics like that, uh, to try to help folks who have uh, tested positive and may need additional assistance in some fashion. Great. Thank you very much. Any, I appreciate that explanation. Other questions, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? 
Any opposed? You recommend? Uh, and again, council member Hurt abstains on RS 2020-1179. That was on consent. Next is a late resolution sponsored by Allen and Welsh that approves an amendment to the Homeless Management Information System Capacity Building Project Grant Agreement between the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Metro Social Services Department to contribute to the national effort to end homelessness. Do you have a motion? It's been moved and seconded. Any questions or comments? Seeing none. Um, seeing none, and I don't see the persons that I would know to ask if they can explain it. I will just go ahead and call for the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? All right, we recommend. Bills on second reading, BL 2021-912, sponsors Allen, O'Connell, Swanner, and Porterfield. This amends the Metro Code to create a mechanism for the implementation of the Inclusionary Housing Incentive Program. Um, there is a letter from the sponsor to defer, which is me, um, and I would like to change that to a, a motion to, to defer two meetings to track with a companion bill with a brief, ex thank you, brief explanation. Um, this is... Sorry, this is a, a partner bill. Councilmember um, Mendez has re referenced another tool that we are trying to create uh, in the toolkit of things that can, can help expand ways to provide housing affordably. Um, this would use the downtown codes height um, bonus program. And this particular bill is the, is the piece of that that provides the funding mechanism. We are still waiting for the planning commission to review the um, the companion bill, so I need to defer this two meetings to track, and I will continue to explain it as many times as I need to, and I also, also welcome input, um, and have already gotten some good stuff, so thank you for that. Any other comments or questions? Council Member Mendez. Just for people who are watching the video now or in the future, um, I just would, I don't want to repeat everything, but we did talk about this during the Affordable Housing Committee and uh, all my comments from that committee apply here and the comments from earlier about RS 2021-1173 on the pilot about the financial analysis that I hope we can do before we um, try to pass this bill applies. And so I, I won't repeat it all now. Thanks. Thank you. I appreciate you. you. You've been consistent on that uh, refrain and I think it's a good one. So with that, this is a motion to defer two meetings. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion is deferred. And last item, I believe, is RS 2021-914, sponsors Toombs, Suara, Welsh, and Porterfield, approves a contract between the mayor's office and the United Way of Middle Tennessee to provide financial counseling and other financial education activities to low-income residents in accordance with the Financial Empowerment Center program model. Do you have a motion? Second. Been moved and seconded. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? You recommend. Any other business we need to deal with or talk about? All right, please take an opportunity to meet Ms. Flannery and we are adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.